What's up guys, we're back, and this week we're gonna educate you on how influencers work. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for the algorithm. I don't know why I spec both my biceps, I was just feeling it, what can I say? There has been a trend I have been noticing with fitness influencers. These people who go to the grocery store and pick something off the aisle and go, oh, don't eat this, cause, and they point to a particular ingredient. Or they say, you gotta eat this food, cause it has this in it, and this does that. These people, I realized, all have the same template, which is find specific ingredient in a particular food that you can either demonize or prop up to be the most amazing thing, and you can make any food look either unbelievably great or absolutely horrible, while completely omitting the actual human data on it. So let me give you an example. I actually did this on Instagram and Twitter a few weeks ago. Case study number one. You should eat poop to lose fat. It's gotta be insane, right? A significant component of poop is volatile fatty acids or short chain fatty acids. These are things that are produced by your gut microbiome in response mostly to prebiotic fibers. So these short chain or volatile fatty acids are a significant component of fecal matter. One of the most prevalent short chain fatty acids is a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. In human studies, butyrate has been shown to improve insulin sensitivity, and in some other studies, it's been shown to increase the rate of fat oxidation and possibly even cause fat loss. And it improves metabolic health. And people who produce more butyrate, who have more bacteria that produce more butyrate, they tend to be leaner and obese resistant. Therefore, you should eat poop to lose fat. What I've done here is really convince you that this one component of food, it, or well, of poop, is amazing, right? Now, I think most of us know, like, don't eat poop to lose fat. I mean, if, and if you don't know that, if you were that easily swayed by this video, who oh boy. But it's the same template that these influencers use. Did I give you actual research studies? Sure I did, you can read them down there. Now, what I didn't tell you was most of these are in animals. I did cite one that was in humans, but most of these are in animals, and the dosage of butyrate that you would need to cause these effects equates to about 50 to 100 pounds of poop per day. Please keep this in mind. The dosage makes the poison or makes the beneficial ingredient. You have to have the right amount of dosage to get the benefits from something or to have negative effects from it. Let's take a food that everyone will agree is unhealthy. I don't think anybody's gonna disagree on this one. I talked about this on the Dr. Mike podcast that I did a few weeks ago, and hopefully that'll be coming out soon. McDonald's French fries. Here's why, they're a superfood. So McDonald's French fries contain a compound called TBHQ. It's an antioxidant. It's been shown to have anti-cancer effects. It's been shown to improve body composition, possibly lean mass, and reduce body fat. And it's been shown to extend lifespan, therefore, McDonald's french fries, great for longevity, great for building muscle, great for losing fat. What did I tell you? I, everything I told you was true. There is a study to support every single thing I just said, and I'll put it right there in the description. But what did I not tell you? Well, I didn't tell you that they're all in rats, and that the dosage that you would need of TBHQ to get these effects is orders of magnitude higher than what you could ever get from McDonald's french fries. You have to keep in mind, there are multiple things that can be true in the same food. It can be true that it has something in it that's positive. It can also be true that it has things in it that are negative. What matters is what is the overall effect when we measure things like heart disease, cancer, longevity, metabolic health. I think everybody would say that for french fries, you're probably gonna see more negative than positive, even though it has some positive stuff in it. And by the same token, you could take things like Let's take our friend Paul Saladino. Demonizes broccoli, demonizes cruciferous vegetables. Is it true that there could be things in broccoli that may have negative effects? Sure, but there's so many things that have positive effects that obviously that is overcoming that because if we look at the actual human outcome data, people who eat more vegetables, more cruciferous vegetables, have lower rates of heart disease, have better metabolic health, and have less weight gain, not more. When you are picking out specific nutrients, what you're doing is the equivalent of picking out a particular stock in a mutual fund. Now a mutual fund, for those not familiar, a mutual fund is usually hundreds if not even thousands of little individual stocks wrapped up in one big investment. For a lot of people who don't have the money to diversify in individual stocks, they invest in mutual funds because mutual funds are more cost effective to be diversified. If I've got a mutual fund with say 200 stocks in it and that mutual fund is up by 40% this past year. But if I go, oh, you don't wanna invest in this, 
Look at these two stocks in the mutual fund that are down 50%. What do you care about more? Do you care about the fact that there are two stocks in that mutual fund that are down 50%? Or do you care about the fact that the mutual fund is absolutely crushing it overall? It is only with the foods and ingredients that fit the narrative of the particular fitness influencer. I'll take Paul again and his example of broccoli. Okay, he said, we don't eat broccoli because it has isocyathanates in it. That can prevent the absorption of iodine. Iodine is important for your thyroid, so it can uh, impact your thyroid function. That's going to lower your metabolic rate, and that's going to lead to weight gain. First off, if we look at the human randomized control trials, actually looking at that, we don't see people who consume more cruciferous vegetables having a lower metabolic rate or gaining weight. If anything, you see the opposite. They lose weight. And what about the fact that I can do the exact same thing with meat products? I talked about this in another video. There is a component in meat called NEU5GC. There was a human study, an actual human study, showing that people with Hashimoto's, many of them have antibodies for this particular component of meat. That's actually much stronger evidence that meat negatively impacts the thyroid. Now, I don't think that meat negatively impacts the thyroid because again, the dosage makes the poison. This is not a major component of meat. But again, if you're gonna make a big deal about these components in vegetables, why aren't you making a big deal about the components of meat? And the same thing flip-flops, okay? Vegans will do the same thing. People like Michael Greger, they, I don't know if he's made this particular comparison, but I'm sure he would gladly point out the fact that in this study, NEU5GC caused antibody development and people with Hashimoto's had more antibodies for this particular component of meat. But then he would also completely omit the fact that there are in components of cruciferous vegetables that may prevent iodine absorption. They only pick out the stuff that supports their narrative and their bias. That is why people like this are not reliable sources of information. And that is why you should follow people who give multiple sides to a story, who provide context, who provide nuance, who actually dig into the studies they're citing to explain them to you and explain why it's either good evidence or not great evidence. Just because somebody cites a study, guys, means nothing, okay? Tons of people cite studies, tons of people. How many of you actually go through and read the studies to find out if it says what they say it does? Because I can tell you on our website, on biolane.com, when we publish an article, we put in clickable links so that it is easy for you to go and check it out for yourself. Guess how many people click on a single link? Less than 1%. Now imagine somebody in a video just saying this study, having it flash up on the screen for you know half a second. How many of you are actually going and like freezing the video, writing down the title, and go, I would be surprised if there's actually a single person on any video who actually does that. So just because somebody cites scientific research does not mean they know what they're talking about. This is the fitness influencer tin plate. Cherry pick ingredient, cherry pick study to support whatever you want, pat it with some anecdote from people, then either use that ingredient to fear monger or prop food up as the best thing in the world, either way, depending on your narrative, and then completely omit the human outcome data and completely omit any data to the contrary and completely omit any similar data in the foods that fit your narrative. Vegans completely omit some of these things, some of these possible negative outcomes. And then people in the carnivore do the same thing. People in keto do the same thing. People in fasting do the same thing. Please keep in mind, guys, the following phrase. There are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. For every single food, there are probably positives and negatives. Whether or not a food is positive or negative depends on the overall summation of all the mechanisms and all the pathways that food activates. And that's why we look for what? Are you ready? Say it with me. Human randomized control trials. And I'm out.